Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Riga Conference Future Leaders Forum. Uh, I welcome you all to the discussion uh, on the challenges between NATO and China. Uh, my name is Rudolf Sato Selga, currently a Sinology student in the University of Latvia, but previously uh, international relations student in the Renmin University of China. Uh, it is my pleasure to, uh, to, to be a moderator for this discussion. Uh, to briefly introduce today's topic, uh, I will start with a quote from Jens Stoltenberg. It's about taking into account the China is coming closer to us in the Arctic, in Africa, investing heavily in our infrastructure in Europe and in cybersecurity. For the first time, China's global ambitions uh, were recognized by NATO in last year's NATO summit in London, uh, highlighting both opportunities and challenges that NATO needs to address going forward. Uh, we've, we're being joined by three speakers now uh, to tackle this discussion. Uh, first, we have Jamie Shea, uh, an associate fellow with the International uh, Security Program at the Chatham House. Next, we have Frank Juris, a junior res research associate at the Estonian Foreign uh, Policy Institute. Next, uh, we have Michael Rule, head of the hybrid challenges uh, and energy security section in NATO's Emerging Security Challenges Division. Now, I would like to, uh, to first, I would like to start off by uh, handing the floor over to Mr. Rule, and uh, I would like to see your comments on what are the most important challenges in the short term and how NATO has to mobilize uh, to face them regarding this. This, this, this tells us something. And at the same time, uh, China is a major trading partner and will remain a, ma a major trading partner for most Western countries. Uh, and it's also, of course, as you said, a, a major investor in, in Western economies. Uh, now, the logic of China, sorry, of NATO taking a uh, good look at China um, and at its rise and the implications of its rise is a sound thing to do. Uh, I should just remind uh, reader, readers or viewers rather that NATO has always been influenced by what's going on in Asia. It was after all the Korean War in 1950 that put the O into NATO that turned the treaty into a real venerable organization. So clearly there was always a link of sorts between uh, what was going on in, uh, in Asia and what was going on in Europe. Um, today's attempt of understanding China better is, I think, a major opportunity for uh, uh, the allies to align their positions vis-a-vis -vis China. I don't mean on each and every detail, but on, on at least some basics in some core areas. And this could help denying China the opportunity to divide and rule um, uh, a policy that China is using very well, uh, engaging with e each ally individually so that Beijing somehow always keeps the upper hand. Um, in the Q's and A's later on, I will talk about some of the some of the things that we can do. But I I just like to say uh, three three quick points. First, getting China wrong could ultimately turn out to be more costly than misreading Russia because China is truly on its way up. Russia, I would say, is sort of stagnating. But China, but China is a, is a major global power. It already is. It's not just trying to be. Um, and that's why NATO, uh, NATO's analysis of China will only be productive if it avoids certain pitfalls. And let me just briefly mention some of them. The first is we need to, as we look at China, we need to be aware of generalizations. China is not another Russia just a little bit further east. Uh, China is, uh, is, a, is a different player in many respects, militarily, uh, the way it handles economy as a m means of getting influence, um, uh, it is it, it assaults the Western-based order in a certain way, but not as blatantly, not as frontally as Russia. So uh, we need to really 
not run the danger of generalizing too much. Um, Russia and China both use disinformation campaigns, especially in the COVID crisis, um, and they use cyber attacks, but their strategies are not identical. And we always keep to, have to keep that in mind if you want to have a really good understanding of Russia, uh, of, of Russia and China, because they're both uh, countries we need to deal with. Second, beware of alarmism. Uh, COVID-19 has sharpened some existing trends, including China's tendency to push at the edge of the liberal Western order. Um, and the pandemic has coincided with a series of increasingly uh, assertive actions in China's near neighborhood, uh, including challenging the law of the sea, uh, in the South and East China Sea, clashes on the border with India, tensions with Taiwan. Um, clearly, these trends, including also in the military domain, are worrisome, um, especially when you see them from the vantage point of China's immediate neighbors, especially Taiwan, I would say. But the China challenge for Europe at this stage is clearly an economic challenge and less than a, a military challenge. And my third point, do not confuse cause and effect. Um, much of the challenge that we believe that China is posing to us, notably in economic terms, is the result of our own shortcomings. I mean, who forces us to let China buy our critical infrastructure? We let them buy it and we lament about it. Obviously, there is some disconnect here. Uh, who forces us in, to enter into economic schemes like the Belt and Road Initiative, which may plunge some countries into ever deeper debt? It's, it's a decision we make. It's not a decision China makes. And who forces a Western university, for example, to host a Confucius Institute on its campus? Uh, true, China is casting a large economic and financial shadow, uh, but just to point the finger at China would amount to ignoring our own blind spot, which is our own negligence in our dealing thus far with China. So to repeat again, getting China wrong could be ultimately far more costly than misreading Russia. And that's why we have to invest a lot in getting this right. Thank you very much. I'll come back on some issues in the Q&As. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would actually like to get more comments uh, or if there's more to say about this uh, from, uh, from Frank. Thank you. Uh, I would like to start with uh, describing what kind of a challenge does China pose. Uh, uh, Harvard Law uh, School uh, professor Mark Wu has uh, said that uh, China poses quite a unique challenge. Uh, and this is because uh, uh, Chinese economic apparatus is uh, uh, by, by its built very unique. And he describes it by six uh, different characteristics that I will uh, focus just on three right now. Uh, first of all, after accession to the WTO, China uh, combined its productive forces uh, by, the, uh, by the name of state-owned enterprises under one government-led uh, agency, and this is called the State Asset Supervision and Administration Commission. So what is so unique about it? Many countries uh, have control over their uh, strategic assets. Uh, as this is nothing new. But uh, what is new is that this is done by one government agency. And if you look at the Forbes 500 uh, list, 91 of the state-owned uh, enterprises are on this list. So in a way, this poses quite a unique um, challenge. And if you add there, China also uh, controls the financial assets. Uh, most of the investments done by the, uh, into the Belt and Road Initiative are actually done by state-owned funds or state-owned banks. So this, again, also creates China uh, unforeseen economic challenge, either to distort or like control its own market and also to distort other markets. This enables them to uh, provide services uh, sometimes even below the market value, not sometimes, quite often, actually. And uh, one more important aspect uh, is that China, to great length, still uh, practices planned economy, uh, one of the most known uh, examples of this is made in China 2025 uh, that uh, had its predecessor already before and uh, just recently uh, the Central Committee's uh, plenary session ended when there where they emphasized the uh, plan started with uh, China made in China 2025 by uh, focusing or putting emphasis on um, uh, building up uh, uh, resilience uh, to outside interference and building up its own uh, 
uh, strategic uh, sectors uh, in the new technology. Uh, and of course, without saying uh, the uh, uh, Communist Party's um, uh, influence in, the, in either being it the networks or be it uh, in the promotion of uh, officials in the state-owned enterprises or, or local or, uh, or um, uh, state level. So uh, this all uh, gives us a, a new challenge that we haven't foreseen before. And uh, to add up, uh, we are very focused on uh, thinking about how we describe China. Uh, we are uh, you know, calling it either a rival, calling it a competitor, or calling it a challenger. But uh, we shouldn't uh, neglect how China sees us. And uh, I think this is very a very vital question in order to uh, uh, answer the, uh, what kind of challenge does China pose. And uh, in 1999, uh, Chinese colonels who are now in the rank of generals and whose uh, ideas have been also implemented into the officers' training manuals, uh, they wrote a book called Unrestricted Warfare. And uh, in, the, in this book, they describe how to deal with the uh, Mm, uh, superior military power and their solution to this um, challenge is to uh, pose challenges in uh, challenges that don't lead to direct confrontation be it uh, political uh, criminal social legal infrastructure international uh, uh, organization or, en or env environment wise and i think uh, uh, this is uh, this is in a way what uh, china has been implementing if we just think about the infrastructure and uh, mm, uh, i have i have received my, uh, research myself uh, uh, two examples from the nordic baltic region uh, be it uh, one of them is the talsinki tunnel and the other one is arctic connect underwater um, cable system connecting europe uh, with asia uh, and uh, uh, what I have found out there is that uh, China is, building, is interested in building dual-use facilities that would improve its strategic position in the region. And uh, in the case of Talsinki Tunnel connecting the two capitals of Finland and Estonia, uh, in a way this would be a win-win solution for China. First of all, it would be the Chinese uh, uh, state-owned enterprises who will be the builders or the constructors of the project. And it will very likely be that uh, Chinese banks would give the credit uh, so, uh, in addition, of course, strategic infrastructure would give China a political leverage. And what we have seen with the 5G case is that China is threatening even before the, uh, the infrastructure is built. To, me, to my eyes, this is almost like a guarantee that when it is finalized, then uh, this will, use, will be used for political leverage. And uh, one more important aspect of it is the uh, uh, Ch Chinese Defense White Paper 2019 that stated that uh, China needs to build up uh, 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 blue water capabilities to protect its interest uh, uh, abroad. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, China already has stakes in uh, 12 different European ports. So this is a clear um, sign that uh, uh, China is interested in protecting its uh, interest. Of course, it can't do, it can't build military bases here, but it can very well uh, use the uh, port that it already has stakes in. And uh, to sum up or very quickly describe the other project I mentioned is the Arctic Connect. Uh, uh, and uh, Arctic Connect is meant to connect uh, Europe, uh, European, uh, European uh, internet users with Asian internet users uh, by building an underwater uh, cable, data cable network uh, uh, to Asia. And uh, uh, this is very particular case because in 2015, uh, Finnish state-led company Sinia is promoting it and it was, uh, uh, it was uh, the platform for building it uh, is already chosen. It's Huawei Marine Technology. It's a sub branch of uh, of Huawei, uh, Huawei Technologies, and uh, this poses a serious threat because it will uh, hinder our data protection uh, capabilities. Because according uh, to the Chinese legislation, Chinese companies have to uh, give access to Chinese intelligence um, agencies. Uh, it will improve uh, China's. Uh, data protection because the information, uh, big data that moves between Europe and Asia will go by uh, the cables that it controls by itself. And in addition, it will enable uh, China put, to put into use the, 
uh, to put into use the uh, dual use capabilities that have been building in underwater surveillance because these uh, tables itself can be used for monitoring submarines. Uh, thank you. All right. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and next, I would like to hear some comments uh, from, uh, from Jamie, if he has anything to add or something new to offer. Well, if, if I didn't, uh, you would have wasted your time inviting me to participate in this panel today. Uh, first of all, thanks very much for, for, for the invitation. Uh, really good to engage with my dear friend and former colleague Michael again, to meet Frank, to meet your good self. Um, I have uh, three uh, particular challenges to outline and very briefly, three uh, policy responses. Um, the challenge is, first of all, are China's increasing presence in our space, whether it be our technology space, our energy space, our political space uh, here in Europe. Uh, both Michael and Frank have described this very eloquently, uh, but China is now with us. It's a player. It's in the Arctic. It's in the Mediterranean. It's uh, selling uh, weapons to uh, Serbia. Uh, Italy is the first G7 country to participate in One Belt, One Road. Uh, these uh, f various forms of dependencies have been well documented. We've had the Huawei 5G debate. We now have the EU looking at uh, foreign direct investment screening for Chinese in, in, in investment, uh, uh, for instance. Uh, we look at Chinese uh, influence over our critical infrastructure. Frank has referred to the Chinese ownership of European ports and uh, terminals and hubs and transport networks and, and and all the rest. Uh, of course, uh, the question here uh, for the Europeans, uh, as with the Americans, but more for the Europeans is, you know, where is this the free interplay of globalization? Everybody wants to sell things to everybody. We want open markets. We want an open investment climate. Uh, we need access to the German, uh, to the Chinese market. Uh, BMW and Mercedes know that better than, 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 than anybody, but where does it become uh, a potential tool of uh, hybrid warfare, of coercion, of leverage that China, for example, could exploit in a crisis. So where do we draw the line there? Uh, how do we balance the three C's of uh, cooperation, which we need? Uh, we don't want to make China into an enemy if we don't have to. Uh, uh, how do we balance that with cooperation, with competition, because uh, uh, we can't contain China, we need to uh, compete with it. But how do we confront China? I don't mean confront in a military sense, but where do we push back where we really believe that China is abusing the rules and interfering uh, and uh, uh, basically uh, threatening our security? Uh, so that, that's the first basket, basket of issues, which the European Union, as Michael rightly said, has woken up to over the last year by declaring China as a systemic uh, 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 rival. Um, uh, by the way, those uh, uh, worries don't apply only to China. Germany recently stopped an American company from buying one of its uh, pharmaceutical companies, CureVac. But, but China is the biggest player in that particular economic domain at the moment. I think the first, second thing uh, in terms of a challenge, and I'm also speaking from a NATO perspective, I can speak from a a British perspective or an EU perspective, but today I'm taking NATO uh, because that's the theme of the panel. It's the uh, increasingly uh, important military and strategic relationship between China and Russia, uh, because Russia obviously is the adversary of NATO. There's no sense in denying that. And uh, academics will argue with some reason that historically speaking, there are lots of reasons why these two great behemoths would not come together in the 21st century and their previous attempts uh, when they were both under communist regimes failed, of course, but it's not, and they don't have a formal alliance, uh, although Putin the other day did not rule that out uh, in the discussion at Valdai. But it's clear that to the extent that, the, that China is giving cover to Russia in its geopolitical ambitions, particularly in the Middle East, in Africa, or to the extent that Russia is giving cover to China as it pushes into the South China Sea or vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan or the, does other things. In other words, to the extent that the, their perception of that partnership emboldens the other to take more assertive and more risky action, uh, then obviously it has to be an issue for NATO and it's something that we have to carefully track. There is no sign at the moment uh, not, uh, 
uh, notwithstanding some skepticism about the long term and the fact that Russia clearly is going to be the junior partner in that relationship, but there's no sign yet uh, that that uh, partnership is breaking up. They've just held uh, a number of recent exercises uh, and the like. Um, I think the third issue is clearly, uh, and no prize is for, for, for guessing this, it's the fact that China is now increasingly confronting what we, I say we as a former NATO official uh, in, in the West, think of as the liberal democratic rules-based international order. And there's this increasing realization, which is somewhat disappointing and very sobering, that, that the hopes that the China would have a peaceful rise uh, and would continue to invest heavily in the rules-based order, of which it's probably the greatest beneficiary when you think of trade and investment lifting so many hundreds hundreds of millions of Chinese out of poverty. There's a perception that that simply isn't going to happen uh, any longer. China is going to challenge that order uh, as much as it will seek to uphold it, uh, or it will at least try to redefine some of the rules. And I think, you know, in, in many respects, you know, the, the COVID-19 period has really shown so many signs of that. You know, we, we've had this rather assertive Chinese propaganda campaign to assert the supremacy of authoritarian systems in, in dealing with, with these kind of shocks like pandemics. Although it has to be pointed out that just over the uh, East China Sea is a country called Taiwan with 23 million Chinese people, which so far has had 10, 10 uh, deaths from COVID-19. So uh, I don't personally buy the narrative that authoritarian states uh, are so much better, but obviously the US election campaign and the bad year that the United States has had with uh, uh, racial tensions, with the fallout in the economy, uh, the COVID crisis, the very polarized election campaign has sort of given the Chinese some encouragement to come forward with that narrative that authoritarianism is so much better. Just look at the way in which Chinese TV has covered the United States in the last couple of months, and, you, and you'll very uh, quickly understand uh, what uh, I, 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 I mean. There's also been, of course, China clearly taking advantage of our uh, inward preoccupation during COVID uh, to uh, uh, put more pressure on Taiwan, to clamp down on Hong Kong. Uh, today in the BBC, we've just heard that more uh, Hong Kong MPs have been thrown out of the uh, 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 of parliament and, 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 and so on. It's mistreatment of the Uyghurs uh, and many uh, other things. And this rather aggressive so-called wolf warrior di 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 diplomacy, uh, which shows also that uh, for the first time, China has been much more active in disinformation and hybrid campaigns. Uh, it used to leave these to Russia than it's been uh, in the past. So much so that, by the way, 73% of Americans today, according to the latest Pew Research Survey, now see China uh, as, as, as a uh, threat. Uh, but if that is the case, uh, then what are my three responses? Uh, and I think from a, a NATO perspective, these are all going to be uh, difficult and challenging. The first thing is that we can't deal with uh, China in the way we dealt with Russia during the Cold War. We can't contain China. Uh, uh, we, we need uh, China as an economic partner. It's uh, by far the quickest uh, country to recover from COVID-19. Uh, and many of our hopes of relaunching our economies next year depend precisely on engaging China uh, econ economically. Um, so in other words, the tools that NATO used, essentially, you know, military patience and containment uh, uh, during, uh, successfully with Russia, aren't going to work here. So this is not sort of Cold War redux. Uh, in, in order to deal with the Chinese challenge, we need artificial intelligence. Uh, we need 5G, we need quantum, quantum computing, we need robotics, we need uh, life uh, sciences, we need to improve our education system, we need to improve our infrastructure. The answer to the Chinese challenge is to outcompete China. And uh, if you look at the West at the moment, particularly the United States, it, it, it here, particularly in educational achievements, for example, in science and technology, uh, in investment, it, it's here that we are not looking too good. Now, of course, the challenge for, for NATO in, 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 in this respect uh, it is that uh, you know, NATO is not necessarily a big player in, in those kind of issues. You know, the glory of the Cold War was NATO was in the front seat. It provided the answer to an essentially military problem. But if NATO doesn't have much to say on artificial intelligence, 5G, life sciences, infrastructure, science and technology, education improvements, my sense is that it won't have a massive amount to contribute on this particular discussion. So in other words, the challenge of China for NATO is 
NATO has to see how it can add value to this overall Western effort, which I'm convinced Joe Biden is going to bring to the table very, very soon after his inauguration, where it's not going to be in the traditional NATO role of being the leader, you know, as it is with Russia uh, at the moment in terms of uh, reassurance. The second thing is that what China is doing is challenging the liberal democracies. It's saying that our model is superior to that of the liberal democracies, and therefore the only way to cope with the Chinese challenge in the long run, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Africa, the Middle East, uh, the developing world where China is expanding its influence, is to demonstrate that the liberal democratic model delivers the goods. It's better uh, on all fronts, not just human rights, but economic prosperity as well. And here, unfortunately, look at the United States, look at you know populism in the EU and elsewhere, uh, our values, our cohesion. We haven't been looking too good recently. So how we fix our internal problems is ultimately far more, in my view, than in the foreign policy realm, going to be the key for how we handle the challenge of China. Third and final point, we need to engage China if we're going to solve some of the more global issues, uh, which Joe Biden has announced are going to be one of his priorities. You know, fixing the pandemic, well, we need Chinese vaccines and science uh, there uh, too. Uh, fixing global climate change, where China is now the world's uh, largest uh, emitter, but has also been working very heavily on this issue. We discovered, for example, in NATO just a few years back that dealing with piracy in the Gulf of Aden brought us side by side with Chinese military vessels, which were pursuing exactly the same uh, 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 objective. And of course, you know, don't have time to talk about this now in our introductory remarks, but the whole issue of trade and intellectual property and access and all of these issues, because as I said, uh, we are not going to recover from COVID if we lose our access to the Chinese market and to Chinese money and to Chinese economy and the Chinese economy. So how you compete uh, and uh, to some degree contain uh, but cooperate at the same time, it is going to be a challenge which is going to put a massive premium, uh, not just on US diplomacy, but on NATO diplomacy. Like Michael, I've got uh, some ideas about, more specifically about what NATO could bring to the table here, but I'll leave those for the uh, next round of the discussion. Thank you. Uh, last question is on uh, the topic of cooperation, as we've mostly been uh, hearing about how China's a threat and uh, how we have to deal with them as a, as a, as a, as the superpower that's that's going to overshadow us. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned the, I think it was Ocean Shield. It was called where we we touched uh, with with their navies to to deal with piracy. Um, I would actually like to uh, to next have a ask Frank uh, what he thinks about uh, the topic of Sino-Russian relations, as uh, as we've we've uh, touched upon this already that. That Russia and uh, China have, uh, they're doing military exercises all over, even including in the Baltics. And all the while they might not have uh, any any uh, uh, treaties together or anything, uh, what does this mean to NATO? And since since NATO is uh, say, uh, NATO was basically made to deter Russia or the Soviet Union, uh, what does this mean for NATO? And how should NATO deal with this uh, specific problem? Uh, sorry, I, I think I lost uh, some parts of your question because there was a malfunction in the or like the connection problem. But uh, uh, I, as I understand, the question is involving China-Russia relations and how it affects our region. Yeah. So uh, I will uh, I would uh, I'll first state that I, I think the first alarming bell for us was uh, 2017 when uh, China and Russia. Uh, held a joint uh, navy exercise in the Baltic Sea, so uh, this goes without questions for the Baltic uh, states. Uh, uh, Russia is perceived, uh, regardless of China's rise, as the primary adversary and the uh, primary threat. That this assessments are all involved uh, yeah, are focused on uh, on uh, Russia. So uh, I think uh, there is definitely willingness uh, between these two to cooperate. Uh, uh, and as was already mentioned before, uh, both of them are interested in, um, how to say, building up their uh, operation space uh, in their regions and, and not only in the regions, uh, globally. Uh, so they are both interested in challenging the current world uh, order or, or the norms uh, that, uh, that are present. 
And uh, uh, other thing I would also like to point out that uh, if uh, uh, Russia and China are interested or are showing willingness to co-develop the Northern Sea Route, uh, as we know, this is uh, for Russia a big uh, security concern because uh, very few people live there and this is an uh, enormous territory and uh, the infrastructure there uh, has been desolate uh, after the Cold War. So uh, willingness to cooperate there uh, and not only, not only in uh, transit or traffic or I mean like trade-wise, but also in scientific terms, this is definitely a big sign. And uh, one example, every time these uh, Costco ships or trade ships uh, travel there, they can also collect data, uh, improve the navigation capabilities, uh, uh, the ice movement and so on. And this, uh, this can be also put into use for military wise. Uh, uh, as we know all, uh, this uh, Arctic or polar regions are geostrategically very important. Uh, uh, missiles launched there will reach any place, any place in the Northern Hemisphere the quickest. So I think there's serious concern and serious, uh, uh, we should pay attention to it. Thank you. Uh, we already have some questions coming in from the public. Uh, the first one being, what are the chances that Taiwan or Japan become NATO members? And I, I assume this means uh, same with uh, Mongolia and Korea, New Zealand and Australia, uh, Japan already being one of them. Uh, would this be Taiwan? How could, uh, would it be able to join in some way, shape or form uh, with NATO? And I'll pass this on to Michael. Well, if you look at the Washington Treaty Article 10, it speaks of every any European country being able to apply. So that's a bit of a stretch to go all the way to uh, the Asia Pacific. Uh, I think for um, these countries, the solution is partnership and non-membership. Uh, partnership being, um, of course, a very flexible concept. Uh, you can, and we are, uh, I think, deepening our partnerships with countries in the Asia Pacific already. Um, when you when you look at, uh, for example, Australia. Um, they have very interesting stories to tell about China uh, approaching them, uh, about China, uh, you know, using hybrid means uh, to gain influence, uh, using uh, academia to gain influence and, and the like. So uh, best practices exchange, if you will, uh, with these countries is, I think, imperative if you want to understand China. These countries are closer to China physically, geographically than we are. So uh, having a good relationship with them and, and, and exchanging views on, on China I think is uh, is absolutely necessary, and it's actually part, I think, of the broader uh, NATO effort uh, that I mentioned at the beginning that is still ongoing to understand uh, China better. And the second question that we already have is, uh, what is your opinion about Ursula uh, von der Leyen thanking, Ty uh, thanking Taiwan for donating masks back in April and adding a hashtag uh, stronger together? Uh, Jamie? I'm sorry, Jamie. Could you uh, could you please repeat I, I apologize. that? I apologize. I apologize. You know, I, I I've been on a thousand webinars, but I still haven't learned how to unmute. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I I've got a lot of sympathy for Taiwan because uh, it's a vibrant democracy. Uh, it holds elections where we don't know who the winner is uh, in 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 advance. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, it's demonstrated during the COVID crisis that it knows a thing or two about how to deal with shocks and, and, and pandemics. Uh, and although we know it's impossible, of course, uh, diplomatically to recognize Taiwan uh, as an independent country, we are under you know, the, the one country, two systems kind of regime. Uh, although we discovered that the Chinese don't necessarily respect that when it comes to Hong Kong, uh, but still uh, we have to do what we can can uh, uh, to help uh, the Taiwanese, I think, below the radar screen of formal uh, recognition. That means to say it's probably not possible for Ursula von der Leyen herself to make a sort of state visit uh, uh, to Taipei. But the United States has shown recently by putting other uh, members of the government outside the security apparatus, uh, sending them to Taiwan, that uh, we, you know, we send a signal to the Chinese that we uh, are looking at what's going on, that we're mindful uh, and that we can push back uh, when they try to exert pressure, for example, by organizing rather aggressive military exercises or sending their jets into Taiwanese airspace that has happened uh, recently. Uh, again, like Michael said, I think we have a lot to learn from these Asian countries, particularly about Chinese 
Chinese uh, methodologies, uh, uh, the impact of Chinese investments and trade, uh, in influence operations, uh, uh, in their parliaments, in their media, in their public opinion. You know, China has something that's not really familiar to us in the West, which is this total integration of military and civilian uh, activities, uh, uh, all on behalf of the, uh, the state, and how you deal with that kind of uh, uh, model. So, uh, so though we can't uh, have a a formal dialogue, maybe not in NATO, even have Taiwan as a formal partner in the way that we can have with the other countries. Uh, uh, nonetheless, I think that Taiwan is a country that we shouldn't neglect. They're very, very happy to have a dialogue. And when I was at NATO, for example, it was obvious that I had quite a lot to contribute in the area of cybersecurity and information technology. Uh, as you know, they're one of the big makers, biggest makers of chips in the world. Uh, and, and so uh, it's good to have dialogue. I, and while I've got the floor, I'd just like to make another point i you know I, I agree entirely with michael that i think that it has it's a good thing for nato to have a dialogue with the asia pacific countries uh because they uh, have a lot to uh, tell us about how to handle uh, uh china uh, but i think there's something else uh, which we need to think about we, uh, at the moment uh, because China has not been behaving too productively, you see uh, signs of an increasing organization of the Asian states to balance China. I don't say to contain or to confront China. You know, Mike Pompeo was recently in Tokyo and he organized the Quad with India. Uh, and now Japan with Australia, United States, uh, and you see other uh, things going along. And, and I don't think NATO would like to see in the Asia Pacific the kind of Cold War dividing line of two armed camps that we had to live with in Europe for so many years. So while it's important to see, you know, how we have more regional cooperation to uh, balance China uh, and, and to establish sort of, uh, if you like, red lines, I think it's also important to have help the Asian countries to learn from NATO's experience, which was successful uh, even during the Cold War, about how you also reach out to adversaries, how you construct a military to military dialogue, how you build confidence building measures, you know, all of the things that we associated with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, you know, how you reduce tensions and, and build trust. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it's in our interest to sort of, as I say, alienate China and Russia into some sort of opposing armed uh, camp where you know, confrontation at some stage in the future becomes uh, I I inevitable. We, 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 you know, it, it, these efforts may not work because it takes two to tango, but I think it would be foolhardy not to try. And I think the, you know, not just the containment side of NATO's uh, uh, legacy, but the dialogue, the arms control, uh, the detente side uh, should be brought into play too. And that's also something that we should put on the agenda in these meetings with our Asian partners. Next question, and if, if you would like to answer this one, you can raise your hands. Uh, as China's important partner of NATO states, how to keep how how should we uh, how to keep balance between developing uh, beneficial cooperation and, and deterring Chinese ambitions to enhance influence? If anyone would like to, st Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you. A couple of points. Um, I, first of all, let me say I agree very much with Jamie's point about. This is not all about containment. Uh, this is uh, this would be futile. I think this is not, as I said before, it's not Russia. This is a different, a very different ball game. But I mean, um, and I also agree with Jamie that this is not just about military power. Um, China is already here, and it is it is a, an economic reality, and we all have to sort of make make uh, make up with it. And here, I would say, looking at what we are discussing uh, at NATO right now, for example. Uh, if you look, if you use NATO or the EU, if you use multilateral fora as a, a tool uh, to, for example, look at China together, for example, seeing, de detecting eventual patterns, for example, of industrial acquisition, uh, change national best practices um, in, in denying certain things to be sold to China, as Jamie mentioned already. Uh, uh, for example, identifying fake companies. Um, uh, we we need to to see how we can we can um, keep companies from being sold to 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 China that we don't want to get sold. Uh, I think we have seen in the anti-corona lockdown measures in our own country, we can rise above the you know narrow-minded economic uh, uh, ideas because we think there are other things that are more important, like for example our health. 
So we've already shown that we can we can do differently if we if we have the guts to do it. Um, strongest uh, 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 cyber defenses. I mean, uh, a large part of what China is doing in terms of cyber is espionage. It's industrial espionage, very well known. Um, and so if NATO can be used, uh, you know, uh, through its cyber policies to uh, create more awareness also in, 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 um, in, its, in its member states for, the, uh, for, for better cyber hygiene, if we will, um, this is a big, a big issue that we're looking at. Frank would um, like to intervene. Communications, sorry? Frank would like to intervene. Sorry, if I just, may I just finish? Yes, just, just after, two, two after the sentence. Sure, uh, uh, communications. Uh, nobody prevents us from calling out bad behavior. Uh, you know, if we disagree with what, what China is doing, we should say so. And we should say it not only to China, we should also say it so that our, and this comes back to what Jamie just said, we should say it so that our Asian friends hear it as well. You know, uh, it's, it's, we are not happy with something we, we stated and we point our finger at the, at the culprit. This is part of how you deal with hybrid aggressors in any case. So in other words, um, and the last point maybe, over time, and this discussion has already started in the COVID context, reduce your dependency on China in some key areas. We cannot get out of globalization. China, you know, we want to sell stuff to China. It's a big market. But there are certain things where we, in this, for the sake of our own policy and for the sake of our own economy and for our own health, may have to rethink how dependent do we want to be on China in the future. So there are things, none of them are military, but there are a lot of things where we can do better. Our own behavior determines, I think, to some degree, how influential China will be in Europe. Thank you. Frank, uh, you wanted to comment? Uh, Mr. Rula has said that, and I just wanted to add that uh, it's very important to differentiate between long-term and short-term uh, impact uh, because uh, China has been very good in, you know, selling this Chinese dream, but uh, in most of the Central and Eastern European countries, Estonia included, uh, these great uh, economic opportunities that uh, have been promised to us uh, until this far, they haven't materialized. Estonia, Estonia's exports to China is just 1.3%. So <laughs> uh, if, to, if you think about the sheer size of Chinese economy, this, this is almost uh, nothing. So. But uh, then again, uh, like was pointed out, this infrastructure, you know, these investments, uh, these are not short term investments. This, uh, it is uh, not very likely that uh, if uh, China pressures us to build another Talsinki tunnel, these investments are there to stay for 50 years at least. Uh, so I think this is a very important uh, thing to have in mind. And also other part, what was asked or mentioned in the question was influence. Uh, and I think, I think this, is, this is the most uh, interesting question because uh, to a great, ext great extent uh, these, uh, these projects uh, are promoted uh, not by Chinese here but uh, either lobbying companies that have been hired by the Chinese companies or state or, uh, or co-opted uh, people uh, who still hold on to this narrative of uh, great opportunities uh, and uh, instead of China themselves uh, promote this idea of promote uh, of these possibilities. Uh, but these possibilities can be very, very easily taken away of. Uh, in 2011, uh, Estonian uh, politicians met with Dalai Lama and after that uh, the uh, market for, uh, or like the market access for Estonian uh, dairy products was closed. So China is very willing to use its economic might uh, in comparison to the smaller countries to divide and not divide only uh, European member states between themselves, but also divide regionally. Some regions are less developed in, inside the countries and the opportunities offered to them then also can lead to this kind of divisions inside the countries. And, and, and I think this is very important uh, to pay attention to. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Another question has popped up, um, and if you if you want to answer, please raise your hand. Uh, do you think the military budget rise is recent uh, recently is due to? Uh, sorry, do you think the military the China's military uh, budget rise uh, recently is due to uh, China becoming an economic or the economic um, situation in China becoming higher? Or is it due to global ambitions of uh, military or showing off their military might and uh, 
possibly uh, taking over, or not taking over, but exercising that might. All right, Jamie? I'm sorry, if you could. Uh... Yeah, you automatically uh, mute, but you don't automatically unmute. So I'm, I'm getting used to this. Um, uh, just on the previous thing, very briefly, and then I'll uh, try to answer the very good uh, present question. Uh, I think that uh, Frank made the point very well, which, which is where I wanted to come in. The Chinese are very good at dividing us. Uh, they are excellent at bullying. Uh, individual countries. Uh, for example, Australia recently uh, suggested uh, that there should be a review in China of the circumstances that led to the discovery of COVID-19 when the media and doctors uh, were muzzled and not allowed to uh, say what was going on. Well, you know, the Chinese may have liked that idea or not, but they completely overreacted by uh, imposing beef and barley bans uh, on Australian exports uh, the very next day. Um, uh, the owner of an American uh, baseball uh, team uh, tweets uh, uh, in support of the demonstrations in Hong Kong. The next thing, the Chinese take down National Basketball Association matches from Chinese TV, forcing the American NBA into a humiliating retreat. I could give lots of examples. The Chinese are very good at dividing us because picking us off. So I think one of the issues is going to be this ability to demonstrate unity and solidarity in pushing back against this type of behavior uh, and exacting, of course, some sort of price uh, uh, for it. Um, I think the one of the key things, of course, is that everybody so far uh, has, has gone sort of in a kind of one-on-one -on -one uh, attitude in terms of dealing with China, even within the European Union, from one country to the next, the attitude towards Beijing, the degree of engagement, uh, the willingness, for example, to go along with uh, resolutions in the EU Council criticizing China, recently uh, vetoed by Greece, uh, which has received quite a lot of uh, Chinese investment. You know, th th those levels vary enormously. And, and, and whereas the EU in particular and NATO have managed to come up with one stance toward Russia, and you know, contrary to a lot of uh, uh, predictions, the sanctions against Russia uh, have been rolled over and rolled over um, ever since 2014. Uh, it's been much, much, much harder to come to a common view vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Common principles, common benchmarks, common assessments. NATO has been trying this. I think this is a, a, a meritorious effort. Uh, the EU now has to see if it can do it as well. But, uh, but you know, you cannot, you know, if you're the United States and 23% of the global economy, all by yourself you're not going to roll back China but if you are you know, the Western democracies uh, representing about 65% of global GDP you've got much much more uh, uh, chances of success uh, in imposing once again a, a rules-based type of uh, a system and getting the attention so I think you know establishing a kind of unified approach on China is going to be the key on the Chinese budget I mean I'm not an economist but from everything I read it, it's pretty simple if the economy goes up the military budget more or less automatically goes goes up as well as a percentage of defense spending. And if, of course, the economy goes down, uh, as Russia has shown, even if we think that Russia is an aggressive country that we don't particularly like, but as its economy has contracted, its defense budget has shrunk as well. So I think there is, you know, beyond any kind of you know, theories about the Chinese quest for global domination and, you know, their, their attempt to build a, 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 an indigenous aircraft carrier and stealth jet fighters and modernize their nuclear systems and, uh, and all of the rest, uh, you know, to my mind, it is very much linked to the, the economy, which is growing at about five to six percent at the moment and is recovering quite quickly from COVID. And as it does so, I expect those defense uh, investments to be maintained. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I would like to hear your uh, comments on the sentiment that uh, the popular sentiment, especially in the U.S., that the uh, that EU, sorry, European NATO member states are uh, capable now of uh, deterring Russia and that the US should be allowed to just uh, start focusing on, uh, on the Pacific, on the Asian, uh, Asian part of the world. Uh, I would like to hear your comments, Michael. Okay. Um, I think uh, the fact that the United States uh, is, is drawn towards Asia is a fact that's ongoing for a long time, uh, even uh, before Obama talked about the, the pivot to Asia. 
um, but um, I think the, uh, the United States um, therefore have a legitimate point to turn to the Europeans and say, you guys have to do more for your own defense. But at the same time, I don't think the United States would be so stupid as to leave Europe behind uh, because that would, um, uh, that would, they would shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, Europe is not intrinsically stable. Uh, Europe is uh, not uh, a place that uh, out of its own devices, I think, can, can balance a, uh, let's say, an assertive Russia. Um, you would always need, I think, uh, a, a superpower like the US be involved. It may not be, uh, and it has shown since the end of the Cold War, it doesn't have to be involved with hundreds of thousands of troops in Europe as we used to have in the Cold War. But I think uh, you will always have a, a small but very effective American uh, presence in Europe. Um, uh, but the, the question for us is, of course, uh, for us Europeans, uh, if the United States, uh, for example, uh, faces conflict in Asia, um, what do we do? Um, I'm not saying NATO should should uh, get involved in, in a conflict in Asia, but how do we support the United States? Just politically, uh, do we create, uh, for example, backfill opportunities so that the United States can withdraw or, or move certain forces out of Europe into Asia? Uh, so can we then you know, replace these forces that are going away? These things, I think, are ultimately the, the crucial military parts of the equation. Uh, not NATO in Asia, but uh, how can we support the US and maybe one or two or three other allies uh, in, in Asia, uh, mindful of the fact that many of our own allies have hardly any navies worth speaking of. So uh, how can we cope with the United States that rightly, in my view, legitimately looks more towards Asia? That is, I think, the key question. Uh, and I hope that our discussion on China will also lead to uh, uh, also allow us to answer that question. Uh, if anyone would like to comment on that, that last sentence, uh, Frank, if you could unmute your mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, I'm uh, unmuted now. Yes. 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 Okay. I uh, uh, wanted to add, like, uh, on the how serious uh, military power Europe Europe is. Uh, I think it was a matter of days when uh, the European forces ran out of ammunition, ammunition in the Syrian war. So this, this is already a very bad sign that we are <laughs> not very uh, capable of uh, protecting our power. Uh, so, uh, and uh, to add, uh, I think uh, in the previous administration of US or, or still uh, Trump is in still office, I think uh, uh, U.S. has been going out of its way to uh, convince European powers to take seriously Chinese uh, investments in the strategic infrastructure. Of course, uh, I don't agree with the rhetoric how it was uh, landed to our plate. Uh, it could have been done uh, on a longer period of time and, and a more subtle way. But still, uh, I think uh, what is lacking in Europe in a way is also strategic thinking. Uh, and, and, and this, I think, uh, you know, hopefully uh, we are changing or already seeing, you know, how the rhetoric is changing in, on EU level and I think also on NATO level, uh, the you know, European countries are also more getting on the, on the same viewpoint as US. But to add, on the, uh, add quickly on the, uh, on the budget, I think one uh, very important uh, military budget uh, aspect and that doesn't necessarily uh, be shown in the budget, uh, in the official numbers is that China has been uh, um, uh, has been familiar with this con concept of civil military fusion for for years now since Mao era and uh, even currently uh, Xi Jinping is leading the small leading uh, leading small group on civil military fusion and uh, and uh, I mean, this is this is also uh, something that has to be uh, paid attention to when Chinese are acquiring uh, dual use technology or high tech companies uh, that can be very easily used also for military purposes that of course uh, hinders our stance uh, in strategy wise. Thank you. Jamie, you wanted to uh, comment on both Michael and, uh, and Frank's uh, uh, previous comments. If, if you could 
Thank you for Thank giving you. me the floor on this too. Uh, very briefly, because again, a lot of good things have been said. My, my sense is what we would, we Europeans would like from a Biden administration, I think we'll get it, is simply consistency. Um, I agree with Michael that I think this sort of Europe versus Asia debate has been considerably overplayed. Um, the US has been engaged in Asia uh, since the end of the 19th century. It already has considerable forces in Asia, in Japan, in, in South Korea, uh, uh, Marines in Australia uh, and, and, and the like, uh, and a, a major fleet and naval uh, uh, presence. I, my sense is what, what happened over the last couple of years of the Trump administration is we just simply had uh, a degree of incoherence. One minute Trump was investing more money in infrastructure in Europe and deploying troops in Poland. The next minute he was pulling money away from those funds to build the wall with Mexico, or, or rather against Mexico, uh, and also uh, threatening to pull 12,000 troops out of Germany, not because there was a strategic plan, but because he wanted to punish Germany for not spending enough on, on defense. Similarly with Asia, though, one minute Trump was talking about deploying more forces in Asia, the next minute he was threatening to pull the US forces out of South Korea, because again, South Korea was not uh, being prepared to quadruple its uh, 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 share of the cost of basing those forces in South Korea. So I think, you know, both vis-a-vis -vis Europe and Asia, we've had some degree of inconsistency. I think what we need is a degree of predictability in terms of what the US will contribute to each theater. And that will allow we Europeans, both in Europe and more modestly in Asia, to determine basically what should be the level of the, of, of the upgrading of our own efforts and how we can contribute. Thank you. Uh, uh, for one of our last questions, I, uh, we don't have that much time left. Uh, there's there's a question about anti-terrorism initiatives. Uh, is this where uh, somewhere where the NATO and uh, China could cooperate, or are NATO's and China's uh, views on terrorism a bit different? And if anyone has a, if anyone wants to comment, uh, Michael, floor is yours. Um, I think that. Um while discussing uh, counter-terrorist uh, uh, approaches may not be a, a bad thing to do, I wouldn't pin my hopes too high. I mean, we've had, uh, this was already mentioned by others, we've had a cooperation with the Chinese uh, in maritime domain, in the, in the counter-piracy domain. We also had discussions with the Chinese, for example, on uh, Afghanistan, uh, when, when NATO had a sizable contingent there. And of course, China wanted to know what, what we were up to. That's a legitimate uh, concern. Uh, but, but on terrorism, um, I think the issue is, is uh, NATO's role in counterterrorism is quite small, um, and uh, therefore I would I would not see this as a game changer in our relationship, even if we would have a, a dialogue on counterterrorism. Uh, I think uh, our views on on what does terrorism mean would indeed probably diverge quite a bit, uh, and uh, it has been mentioned earlier uh, the the way. We criticize China sometimes for um, for dealing with minorities, uh, which my, many Chinese would probably see as as, as latent terrorists. Uh, that is not going to bode well for the for the future. But I think we need. Uh, but the question is nevertheless a good question because we need to look systematically at areas where, hmm? if you could please wrap at up. areas where we where we can where we have common interests. It should the dialogue should not just be about things we disagree. We should also identify areas where we can agree and and make progress. In that sense, it, it may not be counterterrorism. It may be other things. But looking for these areas is also part of our endeavor at NATO. Uh, well, thank you for the for answering that last question. Uh, it seems our time is over. I would once again like to thank uh, Jamie Shea. Frank Yuris and Michael Rule for joining us in the discussion about NATO's challenges regarding China. Uh, thank you to the uh, to the questions from our, our audience members and uh, and uh, yeah, have a nice day.